Hello and welcome to the Omnex webinar, Effectively Implementing IATF 16949, ISO 26262, and Automotive Spice in the High-Tech Industries. And today's presenters are Chad Keimel, who is the Omnex CTO and founder. Chad attended the General Motors Institute. Chad also holds master's degree in industrial and operations engineering from University of Michigan and an MBA from the University of Michigan, where he gra graduated cum laude. He was a member of the Tau Beta Pi. Over Chad's successful career, he has served on the Malcolm Baldridge Board of Examiners and received numerous quality achievement awards. The second presenter for today is Greg Gruska. Greg is the Omnex champion for APQP, PPAP, FEMA, ISO 26262, Lean Six Sigma, and is a fellow of ASQ. Greg is an active writing member of the MSA, SPC, FEMA, and eFEMA manual subcommittees. During today's presentation, if you have any questions, please enter them into the questions dialog box and Chad and Greg will answer them at the end of the presentation. The slides and the recording will be available to all attendees after the webinar. Take it away, Chad, Chad and Greg. Miles, thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Effectively Implementing IATF 16949, ISO 26262, and Automotive Spice. In this webinar, we focused especially on the high-tech industries. But looking at the list of attendees, we do see a large you know, variation in terms of many of our traditional customers who are, you know, uh, currently doing automotive parts. And of course, nothing wrong with that. The same three standards apply. The, how we, you know, explain in terms of effectively implementing it also apply. However, some of our specific examples, uh, you know, when we do say, talk about it, we're thinking about our high-tech customers. All right, let's get going. So I have Greg with me here. Good afternoon. And uh, Greg is our functional safety expert, as you know. Um, Greg uh, focuses very much on all different types of risk. So it's very natural for us, for, for Greg to be doing that. Greg also has a very deep knowledge of reliability and also software engineering. So um, thank you for joining today, Greg. All right, thank you. So let's quickly go to the agenda here. All right, so this is the description we gave you in terms of what we wanted to talk about. And um, this is the agenda we have. So, you know, I'll just start by saying this. Every day in the news today, you know, these days, you can see brand new technologies coming to being. In fact, you know, the, the uh, last article I saw was an augmented reality, how it's going to be integrated into the dashboard of the car. So huge amounts of electronics, hardware, and software, and, um, here we're also, you know, faced with a, a certification scheme that's based on automotive parts. And, and let's talk a little bit about, you know, maybe some changes that need to take place. So we'll start with understanding IATF 16949 and implications of organizations or ISO 9001 2015. As you may or may not know, many moons ago, I happened to write help write the semiconductor supplement to the ISO TS 16949. Before that, and with that, and with our involvement uh, with an organization called Semiconductor Assembly Council, SAC, we have worked with the who's who of the semiconductor and high-tech industries. In fact, several of us spent almost years out in Silicon Valley. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about you know, with the idea of the fabulous semiconductor and design-only organizations, or ISO 9001-2015, what do they do? 
And then we'll talk a little bit about why the focus on electronics, hardware, and software. And then we'll talk about integration. Folks, integration is not the only thing. Um, workflows using web-enabled software is another key strategy that companies need to adopt. And we'll tell you why with, with the Automotive Spice, the ISO 26262, and IATF 16949 in new product development, you know, instead of IATF 16949, I probably should say APQPP PAP, it is indeed a very complex distributed network of development. How do we keep everyone on the same page if we really don't have software? So let's continue here. So just to create a level working feel here, because we do know that many of you are from many different, uh, you know, viewpoints. Let me just say, if you didn't know, we here we have the IATF 16949. Key to the IATF 16949, the key to understanding it, is of course CSRs. Don't forget customer CSRs, and especially for our friends who are in hardware. Uh, and, and software, you have so many customer CSRs. And so a strategy for how to work with the CSRs is key. And then there's also the rules for certification, which oftentimes Omnix integrates into our IATF understanding. You cannot forget the core tools. You know, the core tools are absolute requirement, especially for the U.S. customers. And variations of this apply for your European customers, many of which, of whom, will accept the five core tools. And along with that, of course, uh, well, we'll go right into this. Just make sure I didn't I didn't skip anything here. There's a picture of the blue books, as we call them. Folks, you may or may not know, Greg here was instrumental in writing three out of the five of these manuals. And Dan Reed also with Omnix was the uh, was the, other two that the leader for all five. As Dan often reminds me. <laughs> all right. Now we have the IATF certification requirements. Um, here is, as you all as you all may or may not know, IATF requires a site and a remote location. The site is defined as the um, having manufacturing in it, which of course, well, let's let's go through this. Um, so, if you want to get IATF certified, certified, you need to have a manufacturing site, and this is a big problem for um, organizations, you know, especially coming up with new technologies. Oftentimes, these are design organizations, Greg, and these design organizations, you know, uh, subcontract the manufacturing. And uh, this is just the way it is, and the automotive industry really, you know, has to take on these brand new technologies, and we'll tell you why. Because of that, you know, this scheme really needs to be adjusted. Folks, um, I'll just also so introduce to you Mr. Dave Watkins, uh, our, our VP here, who is, is also with us. I, I know Dave likes to make comments <laughs> now and then. I just want to give him the avenue sort of to comment on this. Uh, along with one of my customers, I actually petitioned the um, uh, the IATF a little while ago, a couple of years ago, to no avail, with, with the idea that you know fabulous houses need to be able to adopt IATF 16949. But let me go on. So if you're just ISO 9001 2015 versus IATF, you have 281 additional shells. All right. Why I say that is to talk about the you know, amount of additional requirements that apply to a company that's only ISO 9001-2015. So it behooves 
the automotive industry to have a certification for um, software and uh, design houses that don't have manufacturing, right? Well, we'll tell you how we deal with that as Omnex when we work with companies who are fabulous. All right, so the point here is IETF has significant additional requirements. So some points we need to make for those of you who have not supplied the automotive industry, you know, who are still in the development stages of your product, Point number one, I'd like to, you know, uh, for the longest time, I, you know, I, in fact, I don't believe the U.S., you know, the United States of America, people understand how much improvement has, has taken place in the uh, U.S. car. In fact, many of Omnex's customers today are in parts per billion. Folks, it didn't come by accident. It came by hard work implementing these different tools that we already talked to you about. And um, let me also say this, for the last two years, the US cars have beat the Japanese cars in JD Powers. I don't know if you guys knew that, right? So here we are, this is the industry that's highly disciplined, you know, that has a long life cycle, high-tech companies with the entrepreneurial, you know, uh, organizations, that you know started with this enthusiastic entrepreneur making many changes coming up with a product have to deal with so there are two types of organizations omnix deals with the larger silicon valley organizations and this high tech culture and um, sometimes we see this high tech culture in the larger organizations dave why of course because many smaller organizations are acquired so they acquire these highly entrepreneurial organizations in their midst. So it's a kind of a little bit of a hodgepodge in these larger Silicon Valley organizations. A couple of comments we want to make. In the high tech culture, they started entrepreneurially, grew to a few hundred and then thousands because their product was far superior to the other products out there. I like to tell people the only industry where four or five, you know, whizzes in design can become a large organization. And there's many, many, many organizations out there that you can really comment on. I mean, look at NVIDIA. Look at how fast NVIDIA, but there's many, many examples. Uh, product groups in high tech do not work uh, together and communicate well. So when we work with these organizations, what we often find, you know, the ones that have grown from a, you know, 40, 50 to 1,000, they're actually, you know, they used to work well because they were small and they all used to talk to each other. Now they're isolated. Uh, they're doing ISO 9001. ISO 9001 is looked at with disdain by top management. <laughs> And, and the old ideas of ISO 9001 with the idea of documentation is still prevalent. And they don't really see it as value added. They lack discipline problem solving, lack dis, you know, change management. How about the large Silicon Valley companies? Well, large Silicon Valley companies, I am not quite sure how everybody is similar, but I like to joke and say, that in these companies, if you turn around and spit, they'll tell you in the work instructions or procedures, they, they have procedures which are 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 pages long. They'll tell you what should be the trajectory, how long it'll take to hit the floor and how much dust should come off. I always like to, I like to joke and say, the only person who reads those documents are really the writer. <laughs> you know, who else has the patience? Organizations are siloed, and of course, processes do not move quickly. It's, it's a conundrum because here we are in Silicon Valley. Things are supposed to move quickly, but now that there are a few thousand people, and now we're talking also 30,000 people and, and on up, it just moves at a snail's pace. All right, so here are some suggestions we have into the, so we have uh, reduced the number of design and manufacturing centers for one product. 
we have a customer we're working with that has a hundred different sites. So this is a very large organization. For one product, a hundred different sites. So right off the bat, for folks, if it takes a hundred different sites, you can be guaranteed it's going to be slow and it's going to be difficult and there's no good way to keep everybody on the same page. How can you not have problems? Number two, implement process-based documentation with process owners. Number three, integrate processes so there are no redundant layers. I'll explain that to you. For So some of you listening in have adopted functional safety. And you have adopted functional safety sort of like the OEMs. And IATF has no mention of functional safety. Why? There's a whole other group who have been charged with top management to do functional safety. In the same way we see it in large companies, there is a functional safety group that's doing functional safety and is a standalone, isolated silo. All right. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, the, the functional safety has been implemented in a large number of organizations the way they've implemented quality about 30, 40 years ago when the concept of quality um, as prevention came in, what organizations did is said, okay, we'll form a quality uh, department, and that's the responsibility of this department is to assure quality. Only now do you see organizations where they recognize quality is everybody's uh, obligation. And so quality now is being integrated. Uh, in the past, when we try to get them to do FMEAs, when we were getting started with FMEA, people were very difficult, it was very difficult to get people started because the engineers thought this was a quality job, our uh, job for the quality department. And so the system was not well integrated. Now we see that the uh, companies, the engineering departments are acknowledging that yes, they do have the requirement to be responsible for the FMEA. And so the same thing has happened with functional safety. Functional safety came in, the first response for a lot of companies is we're going to start a functional safety department, and it's going to be their responsibility, and the engineers just continue doing what they were doing, and it doesn't work. Thank you, Greg. We'll talk more about this. That I mean, maybe we won't even get a chance to get into the detail, but much of functional safety needs to be integrated back into the job of the engineer. All right. So how do we go to the next level? Really, it is the you know, streamline new product development. Not only do we need a streamline new product development, you know, we have worked with companies with so much control in place. Uh, Dave, when I even assess them, I ask the question, with this many controls, how the heck will they come up with a new product? And uh, sometimes there's, a, there's a, a balance between the need for control versus the need for speed you cannot get a process with zero defects. <laughs> if, if, you, if you get put so many controls in place, you'll have zero products. All right, implement preventive systems, and as I started out saying, uh, you, can, you can see, you know, uh, as many of you have different initiatives you're focusing on, for us, very importantly, we've been focusing on integrating all this and also putting it into web-based, cloud-based systems. Very important as a next step of in terms of evolving and keeping everybody on the same page. So starting to talk about keeping everybody on the same page, and again, this is too simple a picture. You know, any one of the products for any tier one we're talking about, the picture is way more complicated than this. And remember, we talked to you about a high-tech company. You know, some of you have 10, 15, some of you all the way to 100 different sites just doing software and hardware. And you're coming up with a safety product. And 
So we got all this APQP documents, you have the functional safety documents, and you have automotive spice. So since we have engineers working in some of these companies, what they told me is, you know, when they do a phone call from North America involving European design centers, the Chinese counterparts, and the Indian software engineers, they find everybody is working off different set of requirements. Simple, something as basic as that, if you start like that, you know, it's just calling for a disaster in the making. So the coordination of design and manufacturing with the, the tremendous exchange of information forms and checklists is not possible without technology. All right, let's talk now, segue into the current automotive market and try to understand what's going on. I'm not going to dwell in, 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 in great depths here, except the e-car is on and, you know, electric vehicles are just something that's going to happen eventually, whether we like it or not. The India. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, we were looking at, I don't know if you saw this, India is saying they will go all electric by 2030. I did see something in China also to that yeah. effect. And folks, we ourselves are working with a, a couple of different, uh, including new Chinese OEMs who all want to go you know, electric, uh, with electric vehicles. Then what is happening? Autonomous cars. The race for autonomous cars is on. And let me just tell you this, in my own family, you know, I'm a, I thought, I mean, you may have heard from my introduction that I'm ex-General Motors. Even in my own family, I'm getting a lot of pressure for a Tesla. <laughs> so, you know, so this autonomous car and the idea of the autonomous car and the idea of technology in cars is uh, the race is on. Then, of course, the autonomous braking and improving safety in transportation. All this is increasing uh, the amount of hardware and software. This is actually an old slide. I mean, the amount of, you know, new We'll show you one more slide here in terms of look at the uh, data on electronic content increasing in cars. Folks, that's why the people in Silicon Valley are super interested in this market because it's a market which um, now more readily to accept new, new suppliers and number two, huge volumes, all right? Along with this, what do you expect? That software is a problem. Uh, for those of you who are listening in, and I looked at IATF 16949, why do you think IATF 16949 is focusing on embedded software? Really, it's because software is becoming more and more the reason for recalls. And then also, just wanted to uh, let folks know uh, the new ISO 26262 standard, part 11, right, Greg? The new part 11 is focused on some IC chips. All right. So this now suddenly you understand this autonomous cars, automotive, the autonomous braking is driving really the embedded software. Though there's functional safety that's in ITS 16949, it's really not talking about ISO 26262, all right? This functional safety applies equally to mechanical parts. And, uh, but the embedded software and the requirement, you know, they don't say automotive spice, they say automotive spice or it could be CMM. But really, with the European car makers saying automotive spice and Ford saying automotive spice and the CSRs, pretty much, let's just say it's automotive spice. All right, so then what we have to deal with is three sets of requirements that don't talk to each other. We have IATF 16949, which I already mentioned to you, with its 289 plus, was it 135, 400 some shells. Along with that comes about a six inch stack of paper, which is ISO 2662, 
starting really the, the mandatory requirements start with part two, go all the way to part nine, right? And then also automotive spice with its, uh, you know, processes that it requires. So let's talk about all of these and what do we do in terms of meeting the requirements? So I let Greg, who teaches ISO 26262, talk to you a little bit about the 26262 and how it applies. All right, 26262 is a uh, functional safety for electro electrical and electronic uh, items. It is very assiduous in making sure that it doesn't step on the toes of other technologies, although it does provide a scheme that can be, be provided or can be used for any technology. Um, but it does provide the framework that enables safety management for electrical electronic uh, items. It does require as part of the uh, 26262 standard that for compliance to it, you have to also be compliant to a quality standard, such as ISO 9001 or TS 16949. So it looks at it as being in addition to not replacing 16949. It applies to all the safety related systems that have one or more electrical electronic systems that the, the current one, which is 2011 version of 26262, is restricted to vehicles with a gross vehicle weight up to 3,500 kilograms. The next draft, or the next version, which is supposed to be coming out sometime this year, or early next year, expands it to heavy duty as well as motorcycles. So it, what was originally just a passenger vehicle serial production, it is now expanded across the board. Great, uh, could you, yeah, hang on one second. All right, the, it, it only looks at um, hazards which are caused by malfunctions of the electrical electronic systems. Uh, it doesn't look at the nominal performance. It expects that that be handled by the normal quality management system, which will become more and more important, especially with autonomous vehicles, uh, because with currently, you always have the driver as a fallback on it. It does look at the entire life cycle. So not only does it talk about the design, but it also has requirements for uh, production, although it assumes you're gonna have a quality management system for that, as well as collecting data from the field and uh, the final recycling. So it does provide a automotive specific. It's got um, 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 the looking at it from an automotive manufacturing base to determine the safety uh, integrity levels. It has, they're called ASLs, automotive safety integrity levels and that are geared for the automotive industry. And again, looking at malfunctioning behavior. Okay, so um, the one thing we can say, even though ISO 26262 is focused on, you know, it's specific to automotive life cycles, it is evident that the folks who are writing IATF and, and 26262 and automotive spice are not talking to each other. So let's let's uh, make a couple of comments here. Part two and part eight really talk about, you can think about it, talk about processes. I'm gonna I'm bring that up as quality management systems processes. Part three is unique. Part three does something called uh, uh, item definition. Part three is item definition, HARA, and functional safety concept. That's very unique. In fact, you can only do that at a system level. Of course, if you are uh, you know, um, doing a software development or a hardware development, you can do something called a SEOC. Um, safety element, safety out, of element out of context, all right? 
So that's what we do instead of the concept phase. And, and that is if you're coming up with a general purpose product for the entire industry. And go ahead, Greg. Yeah, you're saying that the part three is, is unique uh, up to a point. It provides more detail. It's equivalent or maps into APQP phase one, the concept phase. A absolutely. And in fact, because we're all about integration, when you define the voice of the customer and you do the HARA, we help you populate the DFMEA. And because especially at the system FMEA level, there is relationships between that that you have to maintain. That's why the HARA cannot be done in isolation away from the, the uh, requirements definition and the DFMEA, the system FMEA. Uh, go ahead. The other thing about the integration, even 26262 does have that as part of its system. If you notice uh, parts 4, 6, that arrow right in the middle of the graphic, that is the hardware software interface. And so the writers of the standard realize that you just don't have hardware by itself and software by itself, but they, the development has to be integrated together starting with the systems level and then continuing on to the hardware and software. So continuing on, part four, part five, and part six either applies to you or to your supplier. Part four is for system developer, system subsystem, or let's say even component. The hardware is, is really thinking about hardware from an electronic hardware viewpoint. And then of course you have software. And you could be doing it internally, you could be doing externally, you could actually have an internal software development group and external software development group. All of them get implicated. And then as I mentioned, part two talks about business processes, or if you wanna, as people always commonly call them, QMS processes, quality management system processes. You also have supporting processes in part eight. Then of course, part nine, has some very detailed language on how to do something called decomposition and some safety-oriented analysis. All right, so there's IATS 16949 with the core tools along, you know, laying out a general framework for how the company should, should function. We have ISO 26262 that takes a deep dive and has overlap in both with IATF and APQP and new product development. I do wanna say one thing. Let me just tell you, for example, whereas, uh, you know, design control, what is design control? Um, and suddenly my brain goes blank. Uh, 8.3, design control, product and process design, says you have to have requirements. When you go to part eight, It'll tell you in detail seven or eight requirements, seven or eight descriptions of how requirements need to be there, how decomposed it needs to be there, how it needs to have measurable qualities to it. And uh, so that's sort of sometimes the relationship between uh, IATF 16949 and 26262 is the level of detail that's there in 26262. The same is true of Automotive Spice. Automotive Spice is a framework and it really has a number of different processes defined for software development. In fact, Spice stands for Software Process Improvement and Capability Determination. And the whole idea is, you know, it came, this methodology was come up with to ensure software is developed, you know, with some rigorous discipline for the automotive business. So when you look at this automotive spice, what you do end up seeing is, of course, there's five levels. As you look at it, each process can be at five different levels. And at a, at a minimum, you're looking at level two or level three, depending on who your OEM is. And in this, you have something called a his scope. Now, I've tried a couple of times to find out if a his scope is satisfactory for IATF. I've not had a clear enough answer from the IATF on this, but here is the Automotive Spice general world of 
requirements that need to be there. All right, so what are the implications of IATF 16949 uh, let's say of these standards for design only. If only if you do only design, here are our suggestions what a fabulous design organization should do. You cannot be IATF, so you need to adopt all the IATF requirements relevant to your company on an ISO 9001 2015 certified uh, base. Adopt the core tools, Automotive Spice or software, and ISO 26262 for safety products. Then we have software organizations with no manufacturing. And uh, what should software organizations do? Be ISO 9001 2015 certified, Automotive Spice, and part six for ISO 26262. And software organizations with manufacturing, if you have manufacturing, then you can actually can be IATF third party certified, <coughs> Automotive Spice, and ISO 26262 Part six and part seven. All right. So, folks, I'm going to pause there for a second and allow you to ask questions that you may want. So, let's look then at integrating IATF 16949, ISO 26262, and Automotive Spice. Anytime we talk about integration, so we've already talked to you a little bit already about effective systems when you came up with four different ideas in terms of how to come up with effective systems. We've also told you about having three different standards and that you need to integrate it. So now what we'll do in this section is talk to you about integration. What do you integrate around? Number one, you integrate around a, a process map or a process approach in IATS 16949. This is the basis for any type of integration. What we'll do is, first we'll talk about integrating design processes. There are typical design processes in automotive. You have a system design, you have a hardware design, and a software design. Folks, sometimes, you know, companies that do have systems and components, you may have a system design and a component design uh, uh, process, or the same system design process is used for subsystems and components. Hardware is used by the hardware group, and software is done by the hardware group. Software group. Greg, one of the things I wanted to share with them is what we have learned from our gap analysis that we have done. And the gap analysis that we have done, oftentimes what we have seen is um, many people are practicing ISO 26262 requirements in you know in different parts of the organization because but they have not documented it as a standard. It's it's not like it's alien. So ISO 26262 oftentimes is just a best in class process that you know good parts of the organization are following. Right? So uh when you just look at this from automotive design, this process that we have here needs to satisfy IATF 16949, APQP, FMEA, PPAP, MSA, SPC, along with what we call CSRs, customer specific requirements. So when you talk about system design, system design aligns with part four, hardware design aligns with part five. Whole different parts of the standards which are just focused on hardware and software. Software design is part six. So go ahead, Greg. Even even though you're absolutely correct that those are the talk here. Even though you're correct, these are the major uh, areas for the systems, hardware, and software design. It turns out, though, that the entire uh, construct of the 26262 does overlap. We did an analysis that we showed that of the work products that are uh, required by 26262, uh, nearly half or over half of them were already covered by uh, IATF 16949. So it's not like it's entirely different. If you're doing uh, 26262, you're fulfilling a large amount of IATF and conversely. Very good point, Greg. So now what we'll do is do a comparison. So we just talked a little bit about a high level comparison between uh, 26262 and IATF. Now, well, let's talk about system design, and there's a system design process 
in automotive spice. There's a hardware design process in automotive spice and a software design process. Sorry, I meant to say in 26262. Pardon me. And here is how the systems engineering processes in automotive spice aligns with part four and the software engineering process aligns with part six. Lots of overlap between all three different genres of, of methodologies. So what do we not want to do? What we don't want to do is this piecemeal approach. And, and Greg explained to you very clearly why you don't want to do that is because over 50% of the work products are similar or identical or can be amended to be satisfying both. Again, what we are seeing is a piecemeal approach, unfortunately. And um, this causes great inefficiency in already in a distributed process involving hundreds and thousands of people all trying to stay on the same page. Can you imagine doing redundant work? Now, I added this section in here because oftentimes many, many of the organizations are forgetting quality management system. In fact, the company we just talked about earlier that's doing functional safety is doing only functional safety in the design side. There's somehow no recognition that there is a quality management systems process, or you can think of it as a business process. So here what we have done is taken part two, part eight, and part seven of 26262 as an example and said, look, part uh, training and competency is there also in 6.2. Internal audits are also there in both 26262 and 9.2. Of course, you may not know it's there in, in part two because they use the word conformance measures. Right. Okay. Because they use the word conformance measures, you may not know conformance measures means internal audits. And you may not know supplier management is there because, in fact, I, it's called distributed development, DIA, in part eight. And you may not know that's actually supplier management, which is in purchasing. And uh, I, I called it process control, but you won't know it by reading part seven. You'll have to go back and say, oh, yeah, part seven and 8.5 have many similar requirements. All right, so you get the idea of integration. Same thing with uh, Automotive Spice. Automotive Spice calls audits and assessments verification or even con you know, conformance reviews, supply monitoring and supply qualification, and there's a change request management process. So lots of overlap between all three processes, lots of different shells looking that can be, you know, integrated into the same process. And I have done a deep dive in terms of change management by doing two or three changes to the IATF 16949 change management process. You can satisfy both 26262 and you can satisfy IATF and Automotive Spice. All right, the last part of this presentation, what I wanna do is talk to you about, you know, some pet projects we've been doing, which is about integration and integrating and, and the idea of improved quality and speed, leveraging what we call design reuse, and hopefully I'll get a chance to talk about design reuse. So remind me about that, Greg. And what we're gonna do is talk to you about key workflows New product development, APQP project management, distributed development. What if you had one workflow, electronic workflow, that satisfied all of that for your entire yourself and your supply chain? What if you had a requirements, HARA, DFMA, PFMA control plan that linked to yourself, to your all your sites and your supply base? PPAP and safety case, audits, assessments, and reviews. And this is one of the projects Omnix has been working, working on using web-enabled workflows. And I just wanted to share this with you. And I thought it, it would be 
bad of us if we didn't share this with you. Here it is, and I'm going to go do this very quickly, is a list of projects for both um, 26262, functional safety, IATF, and automotive spice. And uh, so, so, Greg, how this works is you can have three different projects, and you can integrate that into what is called a program. That way you can see it, you can see it specifically, or you can see it integrated. And of course, I didn't get a chance to show the complexity of the suppliers coming in and the idea that you track in each of these, you track in detail the safety plan or automotive spice is a software implementation or, or the new product APQP implementation. And all three of these are about documentation and of course integrated documentation and how it's tracked and how it's right and how it's a green, yellow, red status over time. And the idea that uh, also the linking of the voice of the customer, how you can flow it down to a subsystem and flow it down further and how it links directly then to your DFMEA. Or how the DFMEA, may I miss, I may miss showing you the horror there, links with the test plan, links with the process flow, PFEMA control plan right to the shop floor. So these are, and, and also, so I don't forget, what we have done this is under family of parts and family of processes. There's an inspection worksheet. Finally, to a mobility device on the shop floor. And the idea of integrated audits, Auditing all three of these in the entire entity structure of the organization from corporate all the way to the sites. All right. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today in terms of, you know, effectively implementing IATF 16949, ISO 26262, and Automotive Spice. What I'd like to do next is give you a few minutes, a few seconds actually to ask any other questions. And then what we'll do is we'll go to the summary of the presentation and then we'll take Q&A. Folks, let's go on to questions here. I'll, um, we have about a dozen questions. Uh, Greg, why don't you take this one on? Um, automotive Spice, you are, we already told you what Automotive Spice stood for. Uh, what does CMM stand for? CMM stands for Capability Maturity Model. Uh, it is a um, strategy which was uh, initially developed at Carnegie Mellon and has been expanded from pure software to now um, they have different models for different uh, uh, technologies. So second question, um, maybe I'll take this on and you can add to it, Greg. Do wire harnesses fall under ISO 26262? And the answer is, Yes, but you know, we cannot just say yes because it depends on the wire harness. So typically what happens in, in uh, ISO 26262 is you have to do a HARA, and in the HARA you'll identify your, uh, uh, you know, those, the, the hazards, and then you'll come up with your safety goals and safety requirements, and then you have to do a deployment down the bomb. So definitely, I can see without any, you know, I mean, I can see unequivocally that the wire harness is going to get implement, implicated in a ASO. Yeah, I guess that would be yeah. the, the major, well, first of all, um, do you have to do 26262 for your wiring harness? And the answer is yes, if your customer says you've got to be compliant to it. So, Second is that, the question, do you have to do anything or extraordinary? And that gets to what Chad said. If a malfunctioning malfunction of that harness could cause a hazard, hazard being very specifically defined as injury to a human being. Um, it doesn't care about the car or the dogs or the cats. It's human beings. If the answer is yes, then you would probably have to do. I would say this: it, it just could be a human being on the road, 
yeah, yeah, any car, kind of human being. Not just the internal of the car. It could be somebody who's standing on the side of the road. Right. You know, because you can see autonomous cars, you know, plowing into, you know, into a grocery store. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, I think we answered that question. I'll just say this, which I meant to say during this webinar, that ISO 26262 is different from everything else in that it'll come to you through your RFQ, okay? Our IATF 6949 and Automotive Spice is out there as a standard, and you have to do it if you have embedded software or if you have a part that goes into a car. And But automotive uh, functional safety right now is requested by the customer. We go on to question number two, which I don't fully understand. Uh, when is the other two requirements mandated in the automotive system, industry with embedded software process? So embedded software, if you have embedded software and you're being IATF 16949, you have to be automotive spice, okay? Uh, or CMMI. But so let's just say automotive spice. I told you the reasons why we say automotive spice. And um, so there is a what is called a his scope, which is a long German word, H I S scope. Talk to your OEM and and find out if a his scope is enough for your automotive spice requirement. Right now, IATF 16949 and your registrar will not, you know, uh, accept that. If you have talked to your registrar and if you know more information than I do, please do email me. Let me go on. If my product is not for safety, do I need A Spice and 26262? And the answer is if your product is not safety, you don't need ISO 26262. But if you do have embedded software, you have to do automotive spice. All right? So the answer is no 26262. Yes to automotive spice if you have a product that, uh, sorry, if you have embedded software. What is the evidence that my processes meets automotive spice? <laughs> Folks, there is uh, all these base practices, which is, you know, absolutely the very, the least requirement you need to have. Let me randomly pick a process. What shall I pick? I'll actually pick MAN3, which is project management. Um, and I can't easily find it. There is MAN3. So you need to have define the work scope, define the product life cycle, evaluate the feasibility of the project, define, monitor, adjust process activities, define, monitor, adjust process estimates and resources. And under each of these, there's multiple requirements. And it goes on for 10 base practices. And there's also a requirement for a number of work products. For example, corrective action register, tracking system, risk management plan, risk mitigation plan, and so on and so on and so on. So automotive spice is very detailed. And of course, if you get the base practice, what level are you? It's level one. So there are, as, I, as we mentioned to you, there are uh, five different levels that go from uh, performed, managed, established, predictable, to innovating. All right. Let's go on. So, in the end of the day, you know, you need to uh, get a gap analysis to automotive spice or assessment to find out at what level you have and you need to have an implementation. But we, we suggest getting an assessment to or gap to IATF 26262 automotive spice from somebody who understands all three of them so we can come up with an integrated plan for your implementation. Folks, we'll take two more questions and then we'll close the webinar. Um, when will these requirements be mandated to the automotive industry? 26262 and automotive spice. Joanne, the answer is automotive spice is already mandated if you have embedded software. 26262 will come to you via um, you know, uh, RFQ or RFP. Let me take the last question here. We are a startup, 
developing a platform for tier two suppliers. How can we benefit uh, from the software in the presentation? Um, Dimitro, please do talk to us. Of course, the end of the day, you know, I, I'm not much in terms of, especially when we do something like this, talking specifically of something that Omnex does. But in the end of the day, if I said it generically, the problem that we see that software is trying to solve is that there are several different development, you know, new product development groups. Now let's think about high tech, thinking you're in high tech, that are doing software development and hardware development, and um, it's distributed out there among a number of different groups. It is almost impossible to keep everybody on the same page if you did not have some sort of electronic workflow helping you do that. So it's uh, end of the day, it is speed, efficiency, and quality. But don't forget also the idea of integration. Folks, with that, I want to thank you all very much for attending this webinar. You know, uh, in, a, in a, another I hope in another couple of weeks, we announce a webinar on the new ISO 26262 that is slated to come out either later this year or next year. And um, um, look forward to having you then or other Omnix webinars. Folks, thank you very much. Thank you on behalf of Omnix from Greg Gruska and myself, Chad Kaimel. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye now.